All right, so we'll give it a couple minutes. I see folks trickling in. Oh, I see a couple of familiar faces. Hey, Mac, nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. How are you? Doing good, man. Oh, there's Linda. Same class. Hi, Hi Linda. We're just waiting. Uh, we'll give it maybe another minute or so. And if nobody shows, then we'll just, it'll be a smaller crowd. I don't know, I assume there'll be a larger crowd today. End of the week, I guess. How's everybody doing? Okay, I'll take that as a great. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell by how fast we're responding. <laughs> Uh, it's probably the end of the week, end of the day for some people. So, it's hello everyone. Hey, Farman. How you doing? Not too bad. How are you? Good, good. Um, well, my name is Akash. Um, I used to do these office hours a while back, and then they got dropped off my calendar, and um, I've decided to kick them back in again. So it's a forum where we can just uh, have a free-flowing agenda. There isn't a, a fixed way of doing this. You're welcome to stay as long as you want. You, you can leave whenever you want. Um, this is just an hour or so I think we have together where um, I'm happy to answer any questions that might be top of mind for anybody. Um, like I said, there isn't a fixed agenda for this, so you're welcome to ask any kind of question. I guess within the realm of uh, Agile and Scrum, I guess a post must have gone out to you folks that uh, we're going to have Agile coach office hours. So my um, my professional experience is essentially grounded in uh, various forms of um, Agile coaching and training. Uh, I have an engineering background and uh, I've worked in the tech space. Hi, somebody's kid wants to say hi. That's all right. I worked in the tech space for uh, over 18 years now. Uh, worked in a variety of roles. You can go to LinkedIn and look at my resume. It's kind of boring to talk about that stuff but if people have questions around agile scrum then i've been doing this for a while i'm happy to answer those questions so you don't have to raise your hand or anything you can just come off mute yell out your question and we can talk about that and once i feel once we feel like the questions have died down then we'll just end the call floor is open so in What's terms up? of in terms of training akash um I, I, for example i have taken the scrum masters and the product owners and i used uh, i used to work at a company where we did videos sort mm -hmm. of agile development but i was i was so i started taking these courses because i want to enhance my skill sets but now i'm wondering should when i look at the at the tracks in in the scrum line should i take the, the other product owner uh class you know the more about i can't remember what it's called i think it's the advanced mm -hmm. class uh or the scrum master does it make sense i mean what can i do to enhance my my skill sets in terms of or should i just buy a book and read it would I get just as much? Yeah, I think that obviously it's a it's a great question. And it kind of applies to, you know, regardless of which role you're trying to specialize in, it applies to anything, I guess. Um, there are always going to be certifications that you can get to, uh, you know, I guess, enrich your vocabulary on certain things and just expand your mindset about things. Scrum Alliance, uh, all of their certifications are role-based. So like you pointed out, they have a Scrum Master track, a Product Owner track, a Developer track. And then some of those advanced level certifications, they go further into like coaching and training um, or practitioner level stuff. It's good to get those certifications. I got them and it definitely, I'd say, opened doors for me from an interview standpoint. Um, I think that you also want to probably think about other uh, credentials that might be specific to your job as such. So like if you're on the product side, then something around like product analytics helps, something around like financial management helps or product pricing and valuation might help. There are plenty of courses out there that a lot of business schools offer. It doesn't have, have to be a full-blown MBA, but there are short like six-week courses, three-month courses, four-month courses they offer. So those are some things to look at as well. If it's a scrum master thing, then you want to focus more on say managerial stuff or leadership stuff or uh, you know speaking like training, facilitation, that kind of stuff. So it really depends on what your area of specialization is going to be. Okay. But if you're asking me about Scrum Alliance certifications, those are good ones to get. I mean, I got almost of them and I aligned my career very tightly with it because I felt like there was a need for it. And that was one of the things that I was good at. And so it felt like an extension of my natural ability. And so I went on pursuing those certifications from there. So I would say before you get any certification, especially with Scrum Alliance, they have uh, PDFs available on the page of every certification, which essentially lists out all the learning objectives of the class. 
So you can go to that PDF. It's available for free, download it. You can look through all those objectives to know exactly what they will talk about in the class. And then if you'd like to, you can go to like you know, YouTube or any other forum online and you can just look up stuff around those topics. And if that's of interest, then I would recommend okay. doing it. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. Was that the question or did I misread that question? No, 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 no. That was the question. Okay. Okay. That cool. was a, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. What else? Anybody else? Um, yeah, I have one. So I am kind of pivoting right now in my career a little bit, um, just because I, I started in the music industry. The first four years of my career were in the music industry. And then the last two years of my career have been um, kind of as a music industry subject matter expert uh, slash like product consultant with some uh, roles in there of like what a, a PM or a PO might typically do. So some like competitive analysis, writing release notes, um, training materials, that type of thing. Um, and so I, I'm looking for a new role right now and I don't wanna take that huge salary hit of going all the way back into the music industry. So I'm more like trying to angle myself for the tech side right now. And I'm curious whether you have any just career guidance on you know how to, because I only have those two years of experience. It feels kind of like, most of the jobs that I look at for a product owner or um, product manager require uh, three years or five years of experience. And so it kind of feels like I don't know what types of roles to apply for. Um, so, yeah, I guess that that's sort of my question. Like, do, do you have any career guidance on that or just kind of like what types of roles I might look for or types of things I might want to get on my resume, certain certifications? Um, if you think they're important specifically like for the the job acquisition angle rather than just like yeah. education. Yeah. So you're generally looking at say product type roles in 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 a tech sector. Is that fair to sort of summarize? Yeah. So something like business analyst, project manager, associate product manager, something like that feels like it might be right I, i'm not sure but wanted yeah. to get your thoughts yeah i think those are the right things to hit on uh, obviously there is you know there's plenty of things you can look at from a enablement standpoint when it comes to certifications in each of those roles so like for for business analysts there's the there's the iiba certifications uh, like the certified business analyst professional are you familiar with that one um, so I okay, see you shaking head uh, yeah, yeah so yeah. there's that uh, for product specialization there's um, here there's a product school. I was looking this up as you were talking. So that's a good one to look at. Um, they've got a bunch of different credentials that go across different areas of product management in general. Um, I would say that the roles you just mentioned are kind of the ones that you would want to probably start with. But then, you know, once, like you said, you don't want to take too much of a hit and you don't want to go back down on your career too much because you've already got a certain level of experience as a professional in general. Uh, I would say even if you start with like an associate product owner or associate product manager role in a company, the rate at which you climb that ladder will be much faster if you already have experience that is transferable uh, from a different field uh, or skills that are transferable rather from a different field. And so I wouldn't get too hung up on, you know, the role that you start with. I would look more about um, the the different companies that are out there and the kind of business they're in. And if that lines up well with your area of expertise, then I would look for that sort of a a correlation as opposed to the, the specific role because the role and everything is is so subjective that can change depending on you know if you're working on a mission critical project depending on the time of the year how the economy is doing all those things will influence how frequently you can move up even in a specific hierarchy so i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't pay too much attention to what level you join the ladder at climbing any ladder is going to be relatively quick i've seen people jump from like a, a team level role to a director level role in no more than a couple of years it just depends on the rate at which they start working through stuff. Uh, but some of the roles you just mentioned is 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 what I would also look at. And then the link that I just shared, maybe take a look at that. It's got a couple of different ways of looking at product management. It's called the Product School. It's a big organization. They have a bunch of different uh, programs you can look at. Um, I want to say there's uh, here's a, there's another one that I haven't looked up in a while. Uh, what is it called? Hold on, I'm looking something up.
uh, I guess they discontinued it. Um, there was a certification called the NPDM, New Product Development Management, and I don't see any links pop up right now. So they must have uh, they must have discontinued that program. It was a certification that was popular a while back. Um, but I'd say product school is a good one to look at. I've been seeing a lot of uh, a lot of resumes that have that sort of stuff on them, especially from like product manager, associate product manager type roles. So that might be a good start, I'd say. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so just a follow up question. When you say, like, don't get hung up on the role that I start with. Um, do you mean kind of to to not worry about like if it's a lower role or do you also mean like in the other direction, don't worry about too much if it's like, you know, you feel like it might be possible at, at some companies for me to go directly into a product manager role? Both. Yeah, I mean, both. Okay. I mean, that if you're getting a, a lower role, if you will, in a hierarchy, but it feels like there's potential to grow there, I would take it because that's what I would do if I were you. Or sometimes I would say, if you feel like you see, um, you know, a director or a senior director level role that you feel like matches up really well with the skills that you're transferring over and the kind of stuff you've done, I would say apply because people are always looking for, you know, outsiders, as we call them, with people who don't have traditional experience in the same field, but have the competency or are you have the potential to be able to grow into that role. So people are always looking to hire in those places as well. You don't know why the company is hiring, who they are hiring. Sometimes they might be hiring because they just want somebody who thinks differently. Sometimes they want people who are not from the same traditional mold because they're trying to push the envelope on something. Especially in the product management world, people I've noticed are always looking for like disruptors. And so disruptors come from different fields. So I would say, you know, actively pursue all of those roles. Don't let the traditional definition of when you should apply for certain things dampen your enthusiasm. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, and and talking from personal experience, I've done that and it worked. And so I would say, try. You, you just got to try. Mm. Yeah. All right. Good luck. Thanks. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Hi, Akash. Here on this side. Hi, Hill. How are you? What's up? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. So, like, uh, my question is, like, I have expertise in uh, technical domain, and I want to pursue in this Scrum Master role, uh, like, in the market. So, like, uh, I have, like, uh, passed the CSM, but, uh, like, in real time, they required some more experience, plus some kind of technical, plus domain knowledge. Uh, through the Scrum Master. So I would like to understand like uh, for the Scrum Master, what are their expectations? You know? Uh, sure. As, yeah. And uh, like another question is like about the, I un understood about the Scrum and the Kanban. So mm -hmm. Kanban is something like I would like to like uh, some, whenever we apply for the as a role, they like, I'm just uh, want to dis distinguish between two both roles like a scrum master versus like agile coach or kanban expertise or that yeah i would like to know more about it sure okay so two questions first question uh was what kind of skills do you need for a scrum master right, right. um obviously beyond the obvious uh skills of having a basic understanding of scrum and knowing how to manage the process and knowing how to get the team to follow the process. Beyond that, I would say to some degree, communication is important because your job essentially is going to be working with people. Your job is going to be to be able to articulate things that you have to say to them and things that they want to say to each other, but may not be able to say to each other efficiently. And so your job is to shepherd the process or provide some sort of a, a framework for them to be able to talk to each other. Because if you think about it, oftentimes people who come from the product side and people who come from the engineering side, they kind of speak two different languages. And okay. sometimes those languages are not fully aligned with each other. And so if the language is not fully aligned with each other, they will need somebody who will shepherd through a, some sort of a process that can help them talk to each other. In Scrum, there could be different ways of doing that, like whether it's product backlog refinement or it's a collaborative sprint review, if you will, with the stakeholders, or it's a sprint planning session where people are talking to each other across the fence from, you know, from the product and the engineering standpoint. So there's that aspect of it. So communication is definitely important. Facilitation is also equally important. A lot of times people conflate communication and facilitation. They're not quite the same. 
facilitation is where you're not really attached to the outcome of the conversation, but you're attached to the mechanics of the conversation, which means you want to make sure that people don't unnecessarily rat hole on things that they do that they shouldn't. The conversation is not spinning. The conversation keeps moving forward. If you need to park something, you you teach people how to park things and come back to it so they can time box discussions efficiently. Also, you know, fostering some sort of a collaborative environment where people have space and time to be able to you know speak their mind and have their voice heard is important. That stuff can also help you. There's a lot of um, you know classes and stuff you can take around that. There are different avenues of how you can improve your skills both on communication and facilitation. So there's the scrum knowledge or the agile broad knowledge, if you will, of planning and execution and how the rhythm of planning and execution works. Then there is also facilitation. There is communication. Uh, to some degree, uh, understanding how to negotiate your way through certain crucial conversations can help, especially if you're working with the product owner to help manage some stakeholder expectations or you're managing expectations within the team members or you're setting working agreements. So being able to talk through that will also help. There are classes you can take on negotiation as well. There's plenty of learning online available for that too. That's another one. Technical skills is not a deal breaker. I have worked in mostly in the tech environment and I have worked with people who sometimes have technical skills, sometimes don't have technical skills. I would say that's not a deal breaker. If you have technical skills and you're working in a tech environment, is it a leg up? Yeah, obviously it's a leg up because you because you can understand the language that people are talking. Yeah. Right? But if you don't have the technical skills, but you have some critical thinking skills like systems thinking or basic organizational design, uh, basics of organizational design, I'd say where how certain roles have to act a certain way. You know what their job descriptions are. You know that they shouldn't be overstepping their boundaries. You know how to create the, the right checks and balances in the process. As long as you can do that, you can critical think your way through certain conversations, even though you might not be fully aware of what the context is. Over time, you can learn those things, right? So when you go to a company, their product is going to be new to you. Their tech is going to be new to you. You're not going to be an expert in all of that everywhere. There's a limiting function to that. And so I would say that is something that's an option, but it's not really a, a deal breaker. At least it wasn't, it hasn't been in, in my experience, I'd say, right? Uh, so those are some skills for a scrum master I would recommend you start to invest in. So there's facilitation, communication, there's negotiation to a large degree, there's process knowledge. So scrum is a great example of that. Other things you mentioned, Kanban, also knowing that uh, because there is some amount of like complementary nature between those two things. Also, they do contradict each other at certain points as well. So it's good to know what the de definition and what the differentiation is between them. So process knowledge also helps. Uh, you mentioned the word agile coach. Yeah. When you talk about coaching, it goes into not just coaching one specific team, but it goes into coaching a lot of other aspects. So there are different stances of coaching that you can take. There are different styles of coaching. There are different levels of coaching. There are team level coaches. Then there are like program level coaches. Then there are like leadership level coaches or there are product coaches. There are engineering coaches. There are process coaches. It really depends on what aspect and how heavily invested your company is in the world of agile, if you will. Right? Not just as a process, but as a way of developing things, as a way of delivering things to the customer. So agile coaches are not going to be the same as scrum masters, meaning they might not always be attached to a team. Sometimes they can be. A lot of times they might not be attached to a team, but they might be attached to a certain problem. The problem could be cultural transformation or process transformation or org redesign, or it could be improving delivery. So improving the developer productivity, if you will, at an organization level, they could be attached to larger initiatives and helping the larger organization, if you will, and not necessarily just one team. So their purview might be much larger. That's sort of the difference between at one level between an agile coach or a coach of any kind versus a scrum master who might be dedicated to a team and might be working with the team embedded with them, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, does that make Thank sense? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So that's Thank the first. You. The second question you asked was uh, the differences between Scrum, uh, people who work in Scrum and people who work in Kanban. Is that what the question yeah, was? Yeah, correct, correct. So in Kanban, so here's the thing. Under the Agile umbrella, you have various kinds of processes, various kinds of methods and methodologies. There's, there's Scrum, there's Kanban, there's extreme programming. There's so many more, right? Every process or every, if you think about what a process is, it's a rhythm of doing something. It's a rhythm of planning, a rhythm of execution. You're either going to plan a certain every week or every other week or every month, every other month, you're going to execute a certain way. You're going to track certain metrics. You have to make sure that there are certain avenues available where people can provide feedback on how you did what you did so that you have you know some information on how you can improve things. All of this is just a rhythm. It's a discipline of doing things a consistent way. Scrum does it differently. Kanban does it differently. In all of these different approaches, there is going to be somebody who is going to be setting the direction for what we should be doing and why we should be doing it. They might come from the product side of the organization. 
there's going to be some people who are responsible to develop these things and deploy it and give it to the customer. So they'll be responsible for designing it, solutioning it, you know, estimating the work and doing the actual work. They'll be the engineers or the developers, if you will. And there's going to be somebody who's responsible for the process side of things. Somebody who's responsible to make sure there's, there's visibility and transparency of information that everybody knows, everybody has the clarity and the competence to get the job done. Those process oriented people could be called as scrum masters. They could be called as agile program managers, project managers. They could be called flow masters or, or Kanban leads, if you will. They're different names, but at the end of the day, you're going to have a product arm of the company, a process arm of the company, and the engineering arm of a company. And then each of these three arms will sort of break up and fan out into different things. So the product might include marketing, sales, pre-sales, biz ops. There could be a whole bunch of things. Then engineering could include architecture, design, modeling, you know, operations, support, development. And then the process arm would be program management, portfolio management, process management, project management. Basically, these three personas will always exist and they'll be called different things according to job codes, according to titles. They might be called different things, but they're essentially going to be doing one of these three things. At least in my experience, these three people generally tend to be, uh, you'd want them to be three distinct roles. You would not want the same person to do these three things because there seems to be a, to a certain degree, there's going to be a, a, a dichotomy, almost like a conflict of interest between the product and the process, between the process and the development. So you don't want the same person to be doing it because then they have certain blinders on. And so you want the right checks and balance. It's like a, the branches of the government, if you will, right? You want yeah. three or four, depending on which country you live in, you want certain distinct arms of the company so they can hold each other accountable. So there's a little bit of a diffusion of that power and responsibility also. So people can hold each other accountable so that the pressure can be established from both sides. And it's not just a pressure from one side. And so that's sort of the answer of, you know, scrum masters or flow masters or Kanban leads, whether you're using Kanban or scrum, the names might be different, but there's still going to be a process oriented role. And so you have to decide, in my opinion, you would want to decide which of the three roles you want to specialize in. Do you want to specialize in the product side of things? Do you want to specialize in the process side of things? Or do you want to specialize in the technical or the engineering side of things? And then you can decide which certifications to get, you know, what specialization to get, what learning, what books to read and all that. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. So think okay. of it like that. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Sally, thank you for waiting. Your hand is up. What's up? Hi, Akash. Hi. Uh, so uh, today I have uh, three questions. Okay. Uh, if you <laughs> if you don't mind, so uh, the first that's what this is, is about. Uh, yes. So the first question is a pinpoint to me, and uh, I think maybe other people on the call they might have share a similar problem. If their uh, organization is still uh, adopting agile, uh, so um, my my organization currently I have I've been the only uh, scrum master for the in house development team. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, and I got promoted to senior scrum master. Then uh, they started to hire more scrum masters, and they are sharing the resources across the the multiple areas, which give me a lot of pain, uh, because you know with sharing the resources, I have problem with uh, the availability of the resources in order to you know complete the task, uh, get the correct estimation on the tasks, mm -hmm. uh, make sure they are available, you know. And the, uh, w uh, the sharing resources that I'm telling you about is either. QA, either the developers, uh, VAs. So this is like impacting my work and delivery big time. I'm trying to keep the 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 same uh, the the same performance that we had last year. We've been like you know top runners last year. We've been mm -hmm. recognized by even by the CEO with all the number of deliverables we had. But I don't know why our company decided to break that down in on the same program into multiple work streams and multiple projects and uh, to try to expand. But this is giving me hard time. Uh, working, I I don't feel like it's it's even comfortable. Um, uh, environment to work in anymore okay so, so sorry, was that a question or was, that a, that, was, was that, it a statement or a question the problem that my question here is i'm trying to see what type of skill or uh, how i can get out of yeah, such problems okay, is it like, okay. fair enough is it a skill uh, that i need to work on i try to yeah. escalate times to uh to uh, my direct supervisors my management teams but yeah. doesn't 
like uh, it's helping. So I need to find out what is a skill that I should be um, having as a scrum master or senior scrum master to have more control on the process. This yeah. is number Number two, if I want to use authority, what type of authority that I can use? Shall I uh, reach out to the agile coach uh, that we have from different team that he can help me to to educate my 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 direct supervisors? What should I do? Yeah, it's a it's a very good question, and I'm I feel bad. I sympathize uh, with your situation. Um, the good there's good news and bad news. Right, the good news is that you're not the only one that's having this issue. There are a lot of companies having the same issue. So you can take some comfort in the fact that it's not a unique problem. It has it has existed for a while and there are solutions available for it. The bad news is that a lot of what will need to be done is not going to be done just by you. It will have to be done by a group of people, right? So let me explain. Your problem, the way you described it, where you have like five people working on five different things and they're never really around to provide the estimation because they're always multitasking. I'm sure these people, if you talk to them, they're always burnt out because they have like 50 yep. things going on in there. So they're not happy with the situation. Everybody's constantly pressed up. And because they're pressed for time, if you go ask them a question, they either don't respond or they get annoyed because they don't have the time to respond. So there's a lot of hostility, probably some negativity as well. So there's generally a negative environment, I would say, from that perspective. I'm sure you're probably seeing a version of that, right? I see you shaking your head. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. So, so this is what I'm trying to say here is right. uh, impact is right now is on the whole or on the whole team. It's not on yeah. me as personally as scrum master, but because I am I'm, I'm the person with the authority here, and I I want to make sure my my team is uh, working properly sure. and have been giving the the number the the workload that they should sure. be working. Yeah. So here are a couple of things that I would say could be your point of leverage. Um, first and foremost, having data-driven conversations is always a good idea, I think. Because when you're talking about data points, you can remove the emotion unnecessary from the conversation. So let's say that you're tracking a simple metric like the predictability of delivery for a team, which means the team is working in whatever short time boxes they're working on, like a sprint or whatever you want to call it, right? At the start of that time box, whatever, what? okay, it's a sprint, Simon. Okay, so if you're doing Scrum, it's a sprint, right? So whatever they commit to at the start of the time box, I would document that. And whatever they finish at the end of the time box, I would document that. And then I would see a trend of that over the last three sprints, if you will, or the last six sprints, if you will. And then I would, if they commit to 10 things and they finished eight things, or they commit to 10 things and they finished five things, I would take those snapshots at the end of say six sprints, right? At the end of every sprint, I would average that over the last six sprints. And I would see what is that percentage. Let's say that percentage is 60%. Right. What that really means is now 60% of the time, this team can be confident that they will complete what is given to them. That's a problem. Any leader, when they look at that number, they'll be like, this is a problem. That means six mm -hmm. times out of 10, the team actually finishes their work. This is not good. Now, once everybody agrees, this is not good. You've at least established a state of urgency among the key decision makers to solve this problem. So that everybody's at least seeing the problem that we don't have predictable delivery. Now the question is, why don't we have predictable delivery? Well, for one, we have five different priorities going on and we can't focus on one thing at a time. So we don't really have a process problem. We have a focus problem. And now the question is, why do you have a focus problem? Maybe because we don't have a single point of contact on the team that can prioritize all the work that needs to be done by the entire team. Maybe they're getting priorities from five different people, right? So then I would go into the conversation of the product owner. Does this product owner always prioritize all the work for the team or are they prioritizing a section of the work and then they're getting three, four, five other things from other people. And then they're playing a juggling act essentially, right? Yeah. So what this will do is one, by tracking that simple commitment versus completion metric, at least it will showcase that the team is struggling with being predictable with their delivery. That's number one. Second, it will also open up the conversation that we have a prioritization problem. That means we can't really focus on one thing, finish it, and then start the next thing. We have five different things going on. And sometimes those five different things are probably conflicting with each other in terms of priorities. So That's... we don't have a true number one, right? Then I would take that further. Once you solve the prioritization problem, then I would take it further into setting up some definitions of ready and definitions of done at the start of the sprint and at the end of the sprint. And I would enforce that. Meaning that when we get to planning, whatever doesn't meet the starting boundary condition does not get into the sprint. No arguments there, no questions. So if something has to get into the sprint and be accepted as a commitment, it needs to be filtered through the definition of ready. And then make that definition ready really detailed. 
list of documents you need, the list of information you need, the approvals you need, all that stuff you need, make a list of that and say, for every requirement, I need these things. Otherwise, I will not have clarity when I start to work. Same thing with definition of done. Set up a good definition of done. When you say you're done with something, you should be done with it. There shouldn't be possibility of defects coming up later in the game. So you shouldn't compromise on your definition of done. Make sure the documentation is done. Make sure the deployment is done. Make sure it is all of your testing that needs to be done in lower environments, higher environments, all that stuff. All that stuff has been taken care of and you can approve it. All of the other stuff from a regulation, governance, compliance, audit, controls, all that things, all that stuff is done. That's why we're saying we're truly done. So make sure you have good boundary conditions at the start of your planning window and at the end of your execution window. At least these things will immediately surface up a lot of noise you might have in your system. And then you can take that noise to the team manager or to the leader or even your agile coach and say, hey boss, these are the things that we are struggling with. Because a lot of times the reason why teams are not able to improve that I've noticed is they're not able to clearly articulate what the problem is. They have 15 problems, but they don't really know what the major problem is. So at least these things, these three, four things will help you articulate exactly what the root cause of the problem might be. Then you can start to further investigate in the you know, future sprints also and start to tweak the process. But at least to begin with, having a backlog centric approach, having one person making the decision on prioritization, having good boundary conditions at the start and at the end, these things, along with some basic metrics around tracking the predictability of delivery, tracking the quality of the delivery, those things can get you off to the races immediately. So try, start with these four things and everything else becomes sort of a sub bullet under these e, e, underneath each of these four things, if you would. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, that's uh, helpful. Thank you very much. So the, the, the follow-up question about the metrics, what type of metrics that I, I can I utilize uh, to help with the productivity and uh, yes. as you mentioned, quality of work? Um, there could be a bunch. Like you could look at, first of all, predictability being a ratio between commitment versus completion. So how much work did you commit to? And divide, or rather, how much work did you finish in the numerator divided by how much work you, co you committed to? So your completion versus commitment. That's like thing, but your speed of delivery, right? That shows predictability, if you will. Then you can take that a step further and you can also look at over the course of the five, six sprints, how does that number weigh against the velocity variation? So velocity variation literally means, let's say you said you would do 10 things and you finished five things, your velocity is five because you could do five things. So you do like approximation? So velocity is of yeah. But it's not an approximation. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, that commitment versus completion, right? You're tracking that intention with your velocity variation. Let me explain. So I hope commitment versus completion made sense, right? Basically commitment, how much did you commit to? How much did you complete? That's the ratio, right? Now put that aside for a second. You're comparing that number with your average velocity variation. So your velocity variation essentially means over the last four or five sprints, whatever number you're looking at, right? What was the actual amount of work that they finished? Did they finish five things, 15 things, 25 things, 30 things, 35 things? The reason why you're comparing those two numbers is, let's say tomorrow you go back to your team and you say from today, we're going to be tracking this commitment versus completion, right? What they'll be looking at is making sure that that number stays 100%. That means if we say we would do five things, we have to finish five things. But what might happen over time is maybe the team's capacity is to do 15 things, but they only commit to five things because they want to make sure that that commitment versus completion gets to 100%. So if they commit to five things, they can finish five things and then they can sneak in a bunch of things that might not be accounted for, right? Mm -hmm. But in that situation, what you will notice is their commitment versus completion, which is five against five, is at 100%, but their velocity is 15. That doesn't make sense, right? Velocity can't be 15, but your commitment is five. That means your, your forecasting ability or your commitment versus completion is out of sync with your velocity variation. But if the forecasting ability is in sync with the velocity variation, meaning you commit to 15 things and you finish 15 things and your velocity is consistently 15, then all the numbers are correlated with each other. So you can track these two numbers, right? Other than this, if you're a tech company, then you can like look at a lot of tech metrics, like there's DORA metrics, D-O-R-A. DORA stands for Development, Operations, Research and Assessment. It's a set of about a couple of hundred metrics uh, like you may have heard of concepts like DevOps, development operations. Right? Yes. DevOps is one part of DORA. D DORA has a lot more metrics in it. You can look it up online. They have a bunch of different metrics. These are some really good ones to start with, at least, let's say. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. That's, that's 
I'll, I'll definitely will use that. The third question is about the, the right now I'm pursuing the RTE certification. So is this yeah. is a good a good progress on uh, you know for a senior scrum master to go in the next level as RTE or what is as like yeah. a career? If yeah, if your company is using some uh, a form of scaling, which is SAFE in this case, so SAFE, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's an acronym. It stands for Scaled Agile Framework for the Enterprise. Um, SAFE has, uh, you can go to SAFE.com, I think it is their website. You can look at their web uh, certification they have. One of the certifications they have is called a Release Train Engineer, RTE certification, which they claim as sort of the Uber Scrum Master certification, where it's like a Scrum Master of Scrum Masters. So as you get to the program level, then you're looking at dependencies across teams, you're looking at coordination across teams, orchestrating delivery across teams. All of that will be the RTE's job profile. And so if that's something that you're pursuing in your company, then getting a certification will certainly help in that perspective, I would say. Yeah, but uh, companies that are not using SAFE, they might not care about that stuff. So think twice before you decide to you know, get a certification, I'd say. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank yes, thank you so much, Akash. Thank you for your time. Good luck. Uh, Sheikh, question. Hi, Akash. Thanks for your time. Hi. Yeah. So basically, sorry, my my daughter is behind me, so he might hear some noise. Uh, yeah. So basically, you know, my question is, um, I'm a, I'm a scrum master for the last three to four years, and you know, I'm in the pathway of you know, becoming an agile coach. So I just wanted to know, understand from you, what is the learning path for an agile coach, and what are the books that I need to refer to? What are the certifications that I have to go to? You know. So right now I'm a yeah. certified scrum master as well as a safe scrum master certified. So these are yeah. two certification I have. And in terms of the job, you know, like it's like a, I mean, my company is a purely like you know EPO driven company, like you know enterprise program office. So they're mostly so they're mostly like traditionally waterfall driven. So yeah. only my only only my team, you know, like I'm I'm working on a product which is like completely agile because it's a new product in the uh, entire Canadian market. So they wanted to try agile, and that's the reason they hired me as a scrum master. And I'm you know like uh, this entire portfolio we are planning, uh, we, are, we are practicing agile. So still you know like it's only scrum is what you know we are uh, following here. And uh, after I came, I you know we are just you know started practicing scrum. At the same time, you now we are just planning to implement few of the. <laughs> Sorry about that. So you're planning to you know like uh, bring in few of the uh, uh, you know safe principles like you know uh, PA planning, quarterly planning, and then um, and then uh, yeah. So we are, we are doing that as well. So I just wanted to know like you know uh, what is my pathway to become an uh, agile coach? Yeah. yeah. So um, here are a, few, a couple of things I would recommend you look at. Um, here I put in the chat. Those are some topics that I would recommend you start uh, looking at and you can look up, you know, books and certifications and classes and all those things. Basically, systems thinking to start with, I would say, will just help you understand how complicated systems work and how large scale systems work, regardless of what the tech stack is, regardless of what the domain is. But it just shows you how the interrelationships between things work and how sometimes when you as an agile coach, when you're making certain recommendations or you're asking certain questions, how you want to look at not just one, but sort of a multivariate solution for things. Or you want to look at multiple patterns, multiple variables of things before you can make any recommendations. So system thinking is a good concept to start with. The next one I would say is problem domain analysis, which is understanding domains of problems or analyzing domains of problems before you start to decide when to use Scrum, when to use Kanban, when to use XP, when to use different processes. How do you make sense of that? So for that, you can look at Kinevin models or OODA loops. These are uh, public facing models that are available online. You can look at, you can Google information about them, but this will give you a better understanding of, you know, when is it the right time to use Scrum? When is the right time to use any kind of an agile practice or a waterfall practice or a phase program planning practice? So all of these helping, just understanding the applicability of different processes to the kind of problem you're solving, like whether it's, you know, SAP implementation versus ERP versus data migration versus non-tech projects. These models can help you make sense of those decisions, right? Um, the third one I would say is organizational change. And organizational change is really about how do you influence change at scale, which means if you don't have the authority to actually drive things, but you have to expose the need for conversations and you have to do what is called as upwards management, meaning you're managing up and not managing down or managing across then understanding how organizational change needs to be structured and how it needs to, you know, I guess, span out an organization, that will be a good start. Quarter change model is a eight step model that helps you understand how to influence change at scale. These are some skills that you would generally see agile coaches have because mainly agile coaches are going to be working 
all across the hierarchy of an organization trying to influence change at different places. So you need to learn, in my opinion, you need to learn how to talk to all of these different people, not just different personas, but different levels of the organization. So the way you talk to an executive is going to be very different than the way you talk to an engineer, right, who is working in one team. And so understanding the economy of those words and the arrangement of those words and what sequencing of all of that and your clarity of thought around that, Cortis Change Model can help you with that. Those are some basic skills I would say start to look at. And then beyond that, um, you know, coaching is such a vast field. You can look at different organizations out there. Scrum Alliance has a bunch of coaching uh, certifications and classes. IC Agile has a bunch as well. Um, there are a bunch of people out there you can follow in both of these organizations that uh, provide a lot of information around coaching. But I would say that at least how I did it was I didn't formally focus on coaching. I first focused on building subject matter expertise around some broader concepts, how systems work, how change management works, how you know human nature at scale works, and then having some subject matter expertise in your own field. Like I'm an engineer, so most of my background is tech. And then I combine that with some management in tech. And I combine that with some process management in tech. And it creates a nice little Venn diagram of different things. So I would say start with that and just apply to a job and become an agile coach and start working with one or two teams. Gradually, everything else you sort of learn on the job. Thank you, Akash. Yeah, of course. Good luck. Um, I don't know who was first. I think Yuvraj was probably first. Yuvraj, go ahead. Hey, Akash. Thanks for this uh, session, uh, firstly. Uh, um, just a quick question. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, can you able to share your experience about um, you know uh, a time where you had to deal with uh, some uh, conflicts, like a conflict resolution, um, you know, at an at a enterprise level uh, or at a larger level. Uh, you know, and the teams as a Scrum Master, so you do deal with the conflicts, but when you are exposed to lead, uh, you know, teams of teams or at a higher level, like from senior director's level. Uh, what? Uh, any experiences that you would like to share with us all? Yeah. Um, so I work at uh, a company called Salesforce in my regular job, Monday to Friday as a senior director. Um, I can't talk about specific things there, but I'll talk in general terms. Um, just as a middle uh, sort of leader in a large organization, what kinds of things I've faced. And this is not just true at my current job, but in general, I'd say, even yeah. back in the day when I was in consulting. Uh, a lot of times when you're uh, when I was dealing with uh, executives or senior leaders, um, it was mostly around explaining what is in it for them and why they should invest in something. Uh, whether that something could be agile coaching or it could be training or it could be you know some kind of a focus around clarifying epic hygiene so like requirements clarification or it could be around like definitions ready and definitions of done for the product or leaders in, in the organization or it could be something around you know building some sort of a system of engagement for people from different time zones to talk to each other you know, whether it's, you know, Confluence or Slack or Microsoft Teams, whatever the communication forum is, and how to improve the working agreements around that. A lot of times with executives or with senior leaders, it used to be about just getting them to, to listen because they're so busy with like 50,000 things on their plate that for them to prioritize even five minutes for a process-oriented issue or a cultural issue, it becomes a problem. Uh, it becomes, uh, they don't have a lot of, you know, attention span for that because they've got in their new in their view, it's much more pressing challenges exist in their world. So what I started to do was starting with some kind of a data point. I would I would present the data point and I would tie that data point to a business driver. And I would say, here's how, like we talked about predictability of delivery. Here's how your business goal that you're targeting for the next two quarters is going to be heavily impacted if these 15 teams or these 25 teams have a commitment versus completion ratio of 25%. There is no way you're going to be able to deliver on that goal six months from now. And you say that and they, I, their ears have already perked up. Now they're like, so what's the problem here? Why are they being unpredictable delivery? What's the problem? Right? And you've got them. So leading with the data point, I found success with uh, when it comes to conflict resolutions, where conflict meaning them just not paying attention to you. That's one example of it that I can think of. Another one sometimes could be just people not seeing value in what you're doing. Like they know or, or they think or they have a version in their mind of what you do as, as an agile practitioner and they just don't see value. They see, they see it as a tax. They see it as something that has to be done because of either a buzzword or because their boss's boss wants you to do it or whatever. 
So at that point, you know, being able to fight through that cynicism or that apathy or that indifference can become a bit of a challenge. And there is no secret sauce to that. It's just a relationship building. And so a lot of times what I do is I don't focus on my agenda. I focus on their agenda. So I don't talk about agile with them. I only talk about what their problems are. So I ask them, how can I help you? Forget about what I do in this company. If I was a resource at your disposal, where would you put me? What can you, what can you give me to solve? And then they would say something like, well, my data hygiene is really bad in this tool. Or they would say that these teams are not able to collaborate effectively, or these teams are not able to plan effectively, or these teams are not able to work together at a release level effectively. So release planning, essentially, or long range planning. Can you help me with some of that stuff, right? And then I would get in there and I would work with the program managers. I would work with their team managers, whether it's an engineering manager or the actual teams. And I would go and solve a couple of those problems. Solving a couple of those problems would give me some currency with them. And I would come back and say, boss, we solved that. And here's the benefit of that. And they would be like, okay, well, great. I have another problem for you. And so at that point, then I would say, well, I can solve that for you. I also happen to notice these two things as I was doing the previous thing. Do you think that's a problem? And then that would open up the conversation around something else. And then that would gradually, you know, build a bit of trust between us. So trust with leaders, especially above me, I have found it can be a result of incremental sort of deposits of predictable behavior. And so if you are valuable to them, if you are useful to them, they will come back to you, they will keep depending on you. And then gradually you can earn their trust. And then from there on, you can start to gradually influence their thinking with your agenda also. But you have to start with what's in it for them. Uh, these are sort of two super high level examples. Outside of this, when it comes to like either teams or even like managers, middle manager level, sometimes it can be about division of labor, like who's supposed to do what. Sometimes it can be not having clarity around that. Sometimes people just not getting along with each other because either they're just talking at each other, they're not talking to each other. So having some working agreements and reminding everybody that we're all on the same team here at the end of the day, right? So you might have your own agenda, but the larger picture is if I don't do my bit, you don't get to finish your bit either. So both of us have to align on this. So Basic mechanics around making sure the what and the why is clear. The how can be negotiated gradually. How is a function usually of constraints? Those kinds of things I've found as sort of examples of conflict resolution. Does that feel close to the ballpark of what you were expecting? Or yeah, that's a well thought uh, answer, I guess. Uh, you know, first drawing the attention and then uh, uh, build up on the trust, and then to uh, it's it's more like an you know. Negotiating your way of, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, Some, you sometimes you got to sing for your supper. There's no other way. And, uh, you know, you got to dance to that. And that's just, it's just the constant thing that you have to do at every level. It doesn't matter what level of the organization you're at. The sooner you can get through that, I think sometimes you can build some trust and some credibility with people. So th there are different ways of doing that, but it's going to be some version of that conversation. You know, what's in it for me, basically. Yeah. As sad yeah. as that is to say, but that a lot of nature of the conversation is like that. Beautiful. Uh, can I ask you another follow-up question? Yeah. If, if you have time? Uh, what would you term as an effective retrospective session? Uh, something concrete coming out of a retrospective session. That concrete thing could be either behavioral improvement, it could be a, a requirement improvement, could be a delivery improvement, could be a metric improvement, could be a commitment from the team to action on something. But something that comes out of that discussion that can quantify the impact of that. Like the discussion, the end result of the discussion can't be, yeah, we talked about stuff. Right? Got to be yeah. something. What did you talk about? What was the thing that didn't work well that you have planned for the next time? And maybe you don't have a lot. Maybe it's just one simple tweak. It could be as simple as, you know, we're going to have a fixed agenda for this meeting the next time. And not the retrospective, but any meeting you're talking about. But we'll make sure there's a fixed agenda. If there's no agenda, we will not waste our time talking about things. So something right. like that. It's something concrete that comes out of it. Whatever that I do, if I create, a, you know, any safer environment, I, I don't know if it is uh, with me or if it's with the team, even if I create a safer environment or uh, have a scheduled one-to-one -one or, uh, you know, give them the comfort that they, they can be able to speak their mind, still, I feel like, you know, certain bunch of people doesn't contribute a lot in the retrospective and I can't take it much out of them. Is there any okay. way or method of yeah. that? You know, have you, have you, uh, do you have a sense of why, if you had to guess, why do you think that is? Uh, yeah, I, I really don't understand why, because uh, I had a one-on-one -on -one session with them as well. And they say like, you know, uh, we don't have anything to say. Okay, great. And so sometimes people don't have a lot of uh, creative juices flowing, so they might need nudges. So a good way to nudge them is by looking at data. Yeah. Like I mentioned the whole idea of predictability of delivery, right? If the predictability of delivery is really low, that's a good talking point. Let's talk about that. 
And I'm sure as you went through the sprint, there would have been something that happened that was a surprise. Either something got thrown in at the last minute or people had some late realizations or something went wrong. Something would have happened. Some event would have happened in the sprint that is that you know warrants a deeper conversation. I would talk about that. I would say, what does everybody think about that? Like if that happened again, how can we react to that better? Sometimes I've noticed that just asking an open-ended question puts too much pressure on people and they kind of get phased that they're not really sure what to talk about. So you want to nudge and guide the conversation and maybe compartmentalize into certain things. So talk small, right? Don't Let's not talk about big things. Let's talk about one simple thing that happened this spring that we can change and get everybody's views on that and then fix a plan on that. Pick an action item. Hopefully somebody signs up for it or a bunch of people sign up for it and you track it. Next time when it happens and people are able to react better to it, reward them in some way. That reward can be anything that the team manager is willing to do. Nice. Thank you. Um, rewards are good in some form, I'd say. Any kind, you know, it, it depends. Rewards can change, but some kind of reward is always good. It can't always be stick. Sometimes it's a carrot also. Yeah. Um, but good luck. Uh, check out, uh, Yura, check out a website called funretrospectives.com. It's got a Oh, bunch I've been of using that. I've been oh, using yeah. fun retrospectives. Uh, the four That's links. a good one. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, I've noticed that there are a couple of other websites that also have some retro stuff like uh, idea boards. Uh, dot com also has a bunch of retrospective items so you can take. Are you working there. closely with me because these two were uh, our enterprise, uh, you know, go tos, idea boards, or fun retros. There are there are know. only so many yeah. websites out there, so they keep circling around in the same community, man. Yeah, and these are the free versions, right? So everywhere, it's free yeah. yeah. Good luck. Thanks. Um, let's see. Oh, Supriya, hi, nice to see you again. Hi, How's hi. It? How are you? Okay, so I have two questions. The first question is, um. I came from a large organization where I worked on a lot of products and it was like a, a sales facing product. So there was a lot of development and a lot of, lot of projects and, you know, the cap CapEx, everything was large scale. I mean, I uh, cannot even think about it. So a, a billion dollar company. Then I moved right. to US. I went into Splunk. So from a sales uh, customer fo focus, org, I shifted to IT org, IT TPM. There was no concept of product managers in India. I was the technical program manager kind of, you know, created the whole life, sky, uh, life cycle for customers, products, uh, applications, you talk about it. When I moved back, the uh, the most applicable job application it looked like was like IT TPM. When I went to it, the IT TPM is basically a backhand team, which works on you know uh, getting the systems, it's basically data migrations, getting the platforms up and all. There's nothing customer focus. So the development life cycle or nothing cool projects I would just say about. From Splunk, I moved to the same IT TPM in uh, uh, Intap, which is just recent, which is very, very small company. Sure. I want to move to a product talk, very customer focused, uh, where the development, you know, the interaction also, you do a lot of developments. The iteration is as fast. Backend team, when you work with them, the project life cycles are pretty long. Some of the projects I've been seeing yeah. in Splunk was like two and a half years, six, I mean, like one and a half years, which I believe is like, it's... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's too long for a project to even run. So I want to move from, you know, IT TPM to a more a TPM or a more product manager role towards customer facing org. So how to transition and how can I work upon? Uh, well, here, everything you said are all the right things that somebody would want in that profile. So I would say apply. Um, you've already gone through a, a product owner certification. You have the basic vocabulary. You've got the experience, it sounds like, of creating, you know, PDLCs and life cycles, like you said. So you have an idea of what the activities are. You know what the sequencing of those things are. You've worked in some capacity where you've prioritized long range plans or roadmaps, if you will. So I would just say apply at this point. So uh, I'm like from uh, TPM Splunk to product manager roles. How do I... I'm it's like, not as much of a dramatic transition as you're thinking it is. No, it's not actually. Basically, the work people, people do make those transitions. I mean, I, I mean that as a, as a, as a word of encouragement. Okay, um, okay. I didn't mean to talk down. Uh, at no, that. no, no. Absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say, in if it, if it feels like a dramatic transition in your head, it's not. I would say I've I've seen a lot of people make that transition. TPMs in general are not going to be, at least in my experience, they're not. They're not going to be prioritizing a lot of the front front facing work. They will be helping orchestrate and manage a lot of that already planned work to make sure that it moves through the chain or the, the flow of value continues. But you're trying to go upstream, it sounds like. You're trying to go up towards the front end of things. 
Correct. And so I would say that it's good that you have an experience of the, the downstream systems also or the downstream processes, but all the experience you've had, you mentioned in India, I think it was where you've worked on the product side is all the right things that they look for. So I would just say apply. Yeah. But, but when I was, you know, interviewing a lot of time, you know, the Indian uh, experience doesn't count actually. See, I, I felt like a challenge. I'm like, I went through a lot of uh, good companies, but I felt they don't understand. I mean, like maybe I was not explaining in the best way, but I felt that because the visit, the I worked for Geo, so I launched all these Geo platforms in India. Yeah. Then I moved, so which was huge. I can't. I mean, the scale of projects that I did there yeah. cannot be compared to even Splunk projects or even any project that I've been doing. But it's just that I can't translate that work over here. I've been telling them I I worked for uh, products which you know garnered at least ten billion investment from Microsoft, Google, and everything because I was in the core forefront TPMs right. who kind of launched applications. But I, they think I mean you know it's like too much of uh, uh, in little terms it's too much of uh, uh, words, not reality. I can't explain to them that what kind of impact that it had. I mean, it, you're able to articulate it now. I, I said, I thought <laughs> that sounded pretty good to me. I'm sure it sounded pretty good to other people on the call as well. I would say that, you know, sometimes you don't really know why people don't, why people turn people down in an interview. I've been through, I want to say at least half a dozen interviews in my life where I went through multiple rounds. And at the end of it, they said that, we're oh, sorry, it's not going to work out. And they don't give you an answer. And so that's always going to be there. I would say, don't let that dampen your enthusiasm. It's just on to the next one, right? This didn't get through, no problem. We're going to go to the next one and then the next one and the next one. And so you're not really, you're not thinking about that. It's like you you do the thing and you drop it and it, it doesn't exist once it's over in your life. Job is like a season, it comes and goes, right? I wouldn't say get attached to that. I would say get attached to your resume. That's yeah, what you right. stay with for, for the entirety of your career. That's, that's who you're married to. But the job is just something you see. It's like going to a restaurant. Today you go here, tomorrow you go there. You just forget about the restaurant. You don't remember it, right? And then every once in a while you go back to the same restaurant because you feel like, yeah, it was a good experience. So we'll go back there again. But that's all it is. It's not, we're not thinking of any anything else from that. So I would say don't don't think too much about that. Would be my recommendation, just as a colleague and a friend, I would say. Okay. Just start. Okay. No yeah, just start. Just start it. Okay. Just start. That's it. Okay. Second yeah. question, totally off topic. Okay. I talk a lot and my thought process is pretty wide because of this. How to, you know, because you speak so beautifully and, you know, every word is like coming out of your mind is orchestrated perfectly. I just want to know when you are speaking, what are the, I mean, like whenever somebody throws a question, what are the two critical things I need to think in mind before going and speaking? Because in India, you speak first and think later. So, yeah. yeah. Well, so how so to do that? Here's what I would say. Uh, when I was coming up to be a trainer for a certified scrum trainer, the first time I got rejected. And the reason they gave me was this guy doesn't know when to shut up. Oh, yeah. And so I also have a problem with the definition of done. I don't, I at least I used to, to a large extent. So I would say it's just practice. It's nothing else. Like whatever we're doing here, I've done this a million times. And so it feels like it's natural, but it's not. There is a rehearsed script in my mind that I always go to. And there are like 15,000 rehearsed scripts. That's just experience. That's just practice. It's not a big deal. Anybody can do that. It is just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And the words just come out naturally. It's nothing It's it's nothing that's creative. It's nothing that somebody came out of, uh, got out of thin air. It's just practice. The things that I did do that helped me though, I can share that. Yeah. I mentioned this in the class. Yeah, also. yeah, I've uh, applied to it. Yes, I have. Yeah, I but think, uh, that I feel the life cycle is too long and I need to accelerate faster, maybe. And and uh, my wife just walked by and if she would have heard that what that comment you just made, that everything comes out of my mouth that is perfectly orchestrated, she would be laughing, rolling <laughs> on the floor right now. And so, you know, I'd say that I've gone through the version of everybody's journey, which is I, I, I would ramble a lot. And then eventually you get to a point where you practice enough that you understand when to talk, when not to. Some of the things that helped me was uh, being very intentional about what I'm going to say. And the way I was able to learn that was on stage doing long form improv. Yeah, okay. It really helped. Going on stage, because I don't know how many of you are familiar with long form improv, but it's basically you showing up with a troop of people on stage with no preparation. And you just basically look at the audience and ask them for a word. And let's say somebody says banana, then in like five seconds, you and your troop have, you know, to come up with some sort of a comedic engaging skit for the next two to three minutes on the word banana. So that teaches you a few things. It teaches you first to think on your feet, 
right? Second, it teaches you not to ramble because if you don't have something intelligent, something funny to say in that situation, obviously that's a dramatic situation. So if you don't have something interesting and engaging to say, you just don't say anything. You wait for somebody else to say something. So what that teaches you is to learn to be comfortable in that awkward silence, which in your mind feels like forever, but it's not. It's just a few seconds, right? The audience only sees it as a few seconds, but you see it as forever because you're the only one standing on stage and the lights are on you and you're like, oh shit, the whole world has stopped and everybody's looking at me. It's not. Everybody's probably looking at their mobile phone or maybe just wondering something else or maybe they had a bad day. They're thinking about that stuff. They're not thinking about you. So we make a mountain out of this molehill in our heads when we are presenting in front of people. The yeah. same thing happens when you go speak for five minutes at a town hall or a company all hands and you feel like the whole company is watching you. They're not. Maybe 10% of those people are watching you. It's an opportunity for you to get everybody to watch you though. And so if you're able to compose yourself, then yes, you've got them. And now they're really listening to you, but now you're already in the groove because now you're controlling the pace of the conversation. So I think long form improv is a good one to, to look at as a thing that can help you just hone your skills from a speaking standpoint and can help you compose what you're going to say, how soon you're going to say it and how much you're going to say. That's one. Second, um, I would say look at uh, training from the back of the room. That's a really good class to take. Although it has nothing to do with agile or scrum or any of that stuff, but it has a lot to do with just general speaking and facilitation and composing yourself. Oh, sorry. I'll give it to you. Yeah. Somebody said put in the... So here, long form improv. So improvisational uh, comedy, essentially. That's a good one to look at in whichever city you live in. And then... Uh, This is a good one too, training from the back of the room. And then over that, I would say in general, if you want to get better at speaking, it's like anything else. You have to practice it. And so start going to present at user groups or conferences, whether they're smaller conferences or larger conferences. If you feel like it's too overwhelming, then partner with people. And there are always speakers out there who are looking to go and present. So you can, if you have a topic in mind, you can find somebody who's talking about something similar online and reach out to them, cold call and say, hey, I noticed you're also pretty passionate about this stuff. I want to talk about this stuff too. There's this conference coming up. Would you like to co-present? And then you already have a buddy. They'll be like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. And you get on a Zoom call with them, get to know them, present with them. If you like it, you know, continue doing that stuff. So as you do that, you will build more networking, more connections, and one thing leads to another. But the best way I have found to get better at the thing that you want to get better at is just by doing it. You just got to do it. Like, how do you get up early in the morning? You wake up early in the morning. That's it. There is no like five things, six things. Just do it. That's it. Just start. I mean, that's the best way I would say. So get over my inhibition and just do it. Both of them. Yeah. Would, yeah. Just get over it. That's it. And, and just remember, you're the only one that has that. Other people are not thinking that about you. Like, I'm sure when you started talking, there were at least a couple of people thinking, wow, she's really well spoken right here. But in your mind, you're making a mountain all of that. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about that. Just start. Let's say, just start. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And if you want to present at any of the Scrum or the Agile conferences that are coming up, reach out to me. I'm always uh, thinking of doing those things. I don't get a lot of time. But if it works out, then either I can I'll co present with you or there'll be other people I can connect you to. And there will be plenty of people who are always interested in doing these things. So you can always find somebody who's responsible, who's you know interested in it. Okay. That sounds like yeah. a plan. There, there is one, I think, coming up uh, by Scrum Alliance in uh, New Orleans. New Orleans? Uh, okay. I don't know when it is. And I don't know when the submissions are due. Uh, I'm probably going to encourage somebody from my team to go present there. But uh, I was thinking of doing it myself. So I haven't thought about what or what I want to talk about and stuff. but Because I've... I've kind of gotten bored of all the things that I talk about. But if you've got something, then yeah, ping me. Uh, ping me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Check out the timing of it. If the logistics work out and all that, then we can certainly do something. Always okay. happy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, Linda? Two questions. Um, one, you were you made reference earlier uh, when you were talking about organizational change, I think, to an eight-step eight, eight step process. What was the name of that? Um. in the chat Potter's change model by John Cotter okay this okay. is also in your resource repository in the workbook as I remember you took my class and in the workbook last couple of pages it's mentioned there you can look it up okay cool the other question is general so I'm in I'm transitioning in looking for my my next role 
Yes. And I'm in the Seattle area. So do you have any recommendations as to networking besides LinkedIn? Is there anything, yeah. any activities or any where I can actually go meet people and, you know, try to network? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hold on. And this is for product sort of oriented groups or, or in general? So in general, so my background is actually, I was driving transformation. So I was actually managing portfolios. I have an engineering background, but then I went into, you know, finance and, and business transformation stuff. So I'm really, I have a diverse background, so I'm open to whatever. Um, so just looking for professionals. Sure. sure. Okay, so I put three in the chat. The first is scrumalliance.org and second is Agile Alliance and the third is Lifograph. Uh, Scrum Alliance and Agile Alliance have user groups and these user groups are either product specific user groups or like Scrum specific user groups or engineering specific user groups. So you can look up your area and you can filter by location, filter by time zones and all that stuff. And these are free forums where people get together and sometimes it's like a 90 minute get together where first 30 minutes there's going to be networking. The next 30 minutes, there's going to be somebody presenting something from their company or some kind of a pitch that they're making. And then the last 30 minutes is like Q&A and things like that. So you meet a lot of people here who are in the similar field of life in terms of work. And sometimes you even meet like headhunters and people who are looking for jobs, people who are looking to hire people. It's like a mini conference that happens in a lot of different locations around the world. And it's free. Oh, you don't have to pay anything. So you can look at those. Then Lifograph is a specific professional networking group for product people. So this you can find on meetup.com. You can register for it in your area. And then they have a lot of these venture capitalists come in and assess new ideas. And sometimes if they like it, these are like these angel investor type folks who will like give $150,000 of capital seed money for like 25% equity in some new, some new cupcake joint that somebody's trying to establish in downtown Seattle or something like that, right? So you get to see how these things happen. It's sort of a low scale version of um, the television show Shark Tank. Oh, yeah. I've seen that, right? So if uh, you want to see the low scale, like the real low scale version of that that's happening in the world, that's a really good group to join. Oh, okay. Um, so okay. these are some good professional networking groups, I'd say. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Good luck. Uh, I got one more. Uche? Hey, hi. So I have this interview coming up. It's a business analyst position. However, I would also have to um, um, perform the roles of a scrum master as well. Now, the thing is, I think I'll be working with a technical team and it's going to revolve around... Um, IT delivery and um, delivery roadmap, sorry. And then, you know, like the whole um, product life cycle. Um, do you have any tips or any like pointers? Yeah. So here's one I put in the chat. Look up a concept called the case management system by Harvard Business School. Case management mm -hmm. system teaches you how to analyze case studies. So what happens in a lot of BA or product manager type interviews is they will give you a case study in a lot of companies. They will uh, mm -hmm. they'll leave you alone with it. And then they, when they come back, they'll ask you to analyze that case study. Like, what did you find in here? And so there is a systematic way of analyzing a case study, like in terms of the players involved, in terms of the, the numbers involved, in terms of the variables involved. And Harvard Business School has a really amazing system of how they handle case studies. That's called the case management system, where everything is a scenario-based discussion. And they, they walk through the structure of how you should look at problems and how you should look at solving problems. That would be a really good skill to get better at over time. If you subscribe to um, HBS on YouTube, Harvard Business School, and then mm -hmm. start picking up case management methods, they have a lot of different videos around that stuff. So you can look at that. That's a really good way to learn that stuff. Okay. Yeah. That should help you with your interview for sure, I would say. And then in general, outside of that, look up this company, Bain & Company. Uh, go to their website. I think it's bainandcompany.co or something like that. You can find them online. Go to their website and then on their website, there's a specific tab where they have uh, partners at Bain who have given like these five minute videos, 10 minute videos, giving excerpts from previous client engagements. So they talk about how they use case management methods to be to solve certain problems. That shows you a way of how you want to approach certain things. So that's a good sort of dovetail in terms of a real world set of resources or set of real world examples of how to use the case management system that you just learned. Okay. So sort of make it real for you, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. 
Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think Alexander asked the question in chat. Sorry, I missed that, Alexander. I just saw it. So in your experience, what framework, what agile framework is better for outsourcing company? And my work always feels confusing most of the time when we try to put BAU tasks. There isn't one that I would say is a sort of a, a gold standard for outsourcing in general. Outsourcing is, an, is a way of working, Alexander, in, in my experience. What I will say though, when you're looking at BAU, like business as usual tasks, which don't have a lot of planning as such, but are more operational in nature, then something like Scrum might not be a great fit for that because Scrum requires you to plan a certain way. So maybe try to look at something that's a little more leaner, like Kanban maybe, which can help you just set up a pipeline and you can kind of just keep feeding and work through that because it's more templatized, it's more operational. There isn't a lot of planning required. That's why in Kanban, you have things like classes of service. Classes of service are like swim lanes of work. So, and just imagine like a multiple swim lane, if you will, where each class of service is a kind of work. And each swim lane will have its own limit to how many things you can do in parallel, which in Kanban is called as a work in process limit, as in how many things are allowed to go in parallel in that swim lane so that you avoid bottleneck and you maintain continuous flow. So maybe Kanban is a good one to look at for that as a resource. Uh, you can look at, uh, oh, sorry, I missed up. Lean Kanban University. It's a really good website that has uh, a lot of information around how to how to manage business as usual type projects. Um, other than that, I would say a really good book. I'm typing, give me a second. That's a really good book. I just put it in the chat around, especially like business as usual kind of projects. It's called Complex Infrastructure Projects by Anthony Holmes. It's a, it's a collection of case studies or different kinds of, you know, operational oriented uh, projects that are executed using some sort of a continuous flow model. So it could be a good resource for that. I hope that helps. I can't see you. So I don't know if you, if that answered your question or not, but I'm hoping it did. Okay, good. Okay. I think we're, uh, we're over time. So I hope this was helpful. Everybody, I might do this again. Uh, if you like, this session, then maybe just send a note to whoever sent you the initial invite saying, yeah, it was good. Let's do it again. I'd love to hear more about this stuff. Um, and then if we get enough people who want it, then we'll keep it going. Otherwise we might just do it once every couple of months or so, but the plan was to do it once every month. Um, or a couple of people said it's very helpful. Good. Okay. So maybe just send a note to them and say, yeah, this is good. Keep it going. Uh, next time when this happens, uh, send me a Google hangout or a zoom link again, so I can dial. All right. Uh, other than that, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. My name is here. I'll put my name. In case you want to reach out. Uh, uh, my name is Akash Srinivasan. It's on my Zoom thing too, I guess, if you hadn't noticed it. Uh, reach out to me if you have questions. I'm fairly approachable. Uh, just reach out to me. I don't like to keep things very formal. If you have questions, reach out anytime. All right? See ya. Thank you, Akash. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Akash. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.